Mother's Day was meant to be a day of joy and laughter, but for the Rodriguez family, it turned into a day of heartbreak and devastation when tragedy struck. Miriam Rodriguez, a courageous woman who fought against a cartel to rescue her daughter, was tragically shot 12 times. Her story, one of bravery, vengeance, and, ultimately, her untimely death, is a tale that remains largely untold. It is a powerful and heartbreaking account of a devoted mother who courageously confronted the drug cartels in Mexico, seeking justice to avenge her daughter's kidnapping and murder until her last breath. Rodriguez was a small family that lived in the city of San Fernando, Mexico. Contrary to being one of the smallest cities in Mexico, San Fernando is recognized as the most densely populated city, with a population of over 60,000 people. San Fernando, a highly populated city, was not only known for its population, but also for being a playground for the criminal underworld. Over the last decade, it has gained popularity due to its unending violence, wars between different cartels, kidnappings, and drug dealing. Despite their fear of the events happening around them, the families in this city strive to carry out their day-to-day -day activities. The Rodriguez family lived in the southern part of the city. The small family comprised Mariam Rodriguez, her husband, and their three biological children, Luis Hector Salinas Rodriguez, their son, Karen Alejandra Salinas Rodriguez, their youngest daughter, and Azalea, their eldest daughter. Mariam was a nurse and owned stores in the city, while her husband was famous as a storekeeper and was well known for selling shoes in the neighborhood. Their first and only son, Luis, took after his mother physically and in character. He helped his father manage their stall and was favored by his father's customers because of his gentle and approachable nature. He moved on to open his shop in the capital, which would later play an essential role in Mariam's quest for justice. Azalea, their eldest daughter, took care of their mom who was out on watch. Karen, the youngest, was still in school. She was a lady who loved to remain low-key and enjoyed having a private life. People described her as a lovely and kind girl. The Rodriguez family, just like many families in San Fernando, lived on edge, constantly in fear of the gang activities happening in the city. But it wasn't always like this in San Fernando. In the early 90s, the town was just as pure as its motto. It wasn't until the cartels took over in 2010 that the city gradually became a mere shadow of its former self. As luck would have it, San Fernando is surrounded by a network of highways that provide access to a strategic border crossing with the United States. The city's network of dirt roads has made it an ideal location for cartels to smuggle without worrying about getting caught by the government. The people in the town disregarded their activities until the early months of 2010, when the rivalry between cartels resulted in a bloody massacre of innocent civilians Federal authorities discovered 70 bodies of Central American migrants, marking the most significant act of violence in the region at that time. A city that was once a haven, the cartel responsible claimed that they suspected the migrants were being recruited by a rival cartel, which led to their killings. In 2011, the cartel known as Los Zetas kidnapped hundreds of people through bus hijackings. They subjected the men to gladiator-style fights to the death and inflicted horrific acts on the women. Just when they thought things would calm down, mass graves containing nearly 200 bodies were discovered that year. A significant number of these bodies were females, and the condition of their private parts indicated the torture they had endured. These cartels would kidnap and rape their female victims, ultimately killing and burying them. Many individuals were taken from bus hijackings, separated from their families, and likely trafficked to support the cartel's activities. Some would go on to demand ransom from their respective families while the deceased person was already buried. Those who attempted to flee were not successful, as their remains were discovered in mass burial sites near the deserted ranch. Sources say that the actual death toll was estimated to be close to 600, as many more undiscovered graves were found later on. These heinous acts instilled constant fear in the people of San Fernando, causing many bars and restaurants to close due to the cartel's intimidation. Families fled the city to save their lives, while others chose to stay. The Rodriguez family was one of them. Luis, Mariam's eldest son, fled to escape the danger in San Fernando. However, Mariam and the rest of the family remained. She and her husband had a business they couldn't abandon, while Karen decided to stay to complete her education and assist at her mother's cowboy store, Rodeo Boots. Mariam and the rest of the family carried out their day-to-day -day activities. Little did they know that a storm was brewing, and it would be one that would change the course of their lives forever. Karen would get kidnapped by one of the famous cartels in San Fernando. It turns out that Karen had caught the attention of a notorious cartel in the city, 
making her the next target on their list. After gathering information about the Rodriguez family, they patiently waited for the perfect opportunity to execute their plan while the family remained oblivious to what was about to unfold. It occurred in January 2014, just weeks after celebrating New Year's Eve. Karen, who was 14 years old then, decided to take the family truck out. She was driving in a relatively rural area when two cars surrounded her. The next thing she saw was a group of armed men who forcefully pulled her out of the car, covered her mouth to prevent her from screaming, and forcibly dragged her into their vehicle. The men moved on to the second phase of their ransom plan. Sources say they initially planned to stay at the Rodriguez house, waiting for the family to return. Their plan hit a snag when a family friend unexpectedly visited the Rodriguez's home to work on a car. This action caught the men off guard, leading them to take both Karen and her friend as hostages before leaving the residence. While all this was happening, Miriam's husband was in the shop attending to customers until his phone rang and an unknown number was calling him. He picked it up and what he heard next shook his mind. There was the voice of his youngest daughter, Karen, screaming, Dad, Dad, they want money. Gather everything you can. The kidnappers took the phone from her and asked him for a ransom that he had to pay before he could get to see his daughter again. When the news reached Azalea, she broke down in tears. She never imagined such a thing would happen to Karen. She had just spoken with her sister earlier that day. When she composed herself, she picked up the phone to call Miriam, who was out on a nanny job at that time. When she received the call, she quickly packed her belongings and left a note for the family she worked for in McAllen, Texas. She was a full-time nanny for their young child, whom she adored. She informed them that she would not be returning. By 6 a.m. on that January in 2014, she made her way to the International Bridge in Reynosa and waited for the bus to take her to San Fernando. It was a two-hour journey through the center of the state of Tamaulipas, Mexico. Miriam couldn't help but break down in tears on the bus. She sat near the back and silently wept for Karen, her youngest daughter, who was only 20. Many thoughts crossed her mind at that moment. She regretted leaving Karen alone and not allowing Luis to take Karen with him when he left. She clung to the hope of her child being alive and hoped that they wouldn't harm her daughter. An older man sitting across handed her his handkerchief and asked if she was okay. Miriam, feeling broken, confided in him about her daughter being kidnapped by one of the San Fernando cartels and her fear of her daughter becoming one of the tens of thousands of disappeared. Most kidnapping cases went unsolved and she hoped her daughter wouldn't be among them, but fate had other plans. On the street, she unloaded her bags and hugged Azalea, who was still overwhelmed by what had happened. After Miriam settled into the car, her phone rang. The kidnapper told Miriam to be quiet as he outlined their demands, then handed the phone to Karen. When she heard her daughter's voice, Miriam felt her whole world turn upside down. Karen's mother anxiously inquired about her well-being, struggling to maintain composure. Karen, trembling, revealed that the cartel had targeted her for money and urged her family to gather whatever they could to secure her release. This talk was the same plea she had made to her father when the kidnappers had contacted him earlier. The call abruptly ended, leaving Karen's mother in tears, a sight her family had never witnessed before. They were all in turmoil, knowing that Karen's fate rested in the hands of ruthless individuals for whom violence was just another business tactic. Her brother, Luis Hector, tried to reassure everyone, emphasizing that the Zetas were businessmen who would uphold their end of the deal as long as the ransom was paid. The family clung to his words as they teetered between hope and despair. Luis, Karen's father, rushed to the bank, leveraging his long-standing relationship with the managers to secure a ransom loan. The city had seen so many abductions that the bank had specific borrowing options for such situations. After obtaining the loan, Luis received another call from the Zetas, instructing him to bring the money to the San Fernando Health Center alone, where it would be collected, and information about Karen's whereabouts would be provided. Luis and Mariam had gathered the ransom and reached the designated meeting spot. Miriam parked discreetly down the street from the health center, keeping a watchful eye on the handoff. A few people were seated on fold-out chairs while others lingered outside. Luis stood waiting, tense with anticipation. After a two-hour wait, the bagman finally arrived. He had the wiry build of a teenager, with barely a hint of facial hair and a slender chest. As he reached for the money bag, Luis hesitated, demanding information about his daughter. All he received in return were instructions directing him to a cemetery in 20 minutes. Miriam observed as the teenager swiftly hopped into a cherry red Ford Explorer and sped away. The couple drove cautiously to the nearby cemetery, their hearts heavy with worry. They waited in the parking lot until darkness fell, but no one appeared. They tried reaching out but received no response. The cartel had taken their money without fulfilling their promise. Desperate for help, the couple turned to various police stations 
seeking assistance with their case. However, they found many were preoccupied with other issues of missing children, leaving Miriam disheartened. Despite her anguish, she tirelessly searched the areas where cartels were known to frequent, hoping to find someone who could lead her to her daughter. Two days after the ordeal, Miriam was driving in San Fernando when she noticed the Red Explorer tailing closely behind her. She tried to remain composed, but the driver abruptly cut her off in the middle of the street before she could change direction. They instructed her to meet their leader at restaurant El Junior in San Fernando in 10 minutes. Mariam met a tall man named Sama with a thin face, fair skin, and curly hair. His handheld radio crackled with updates from lookouts around town, reporting on the movements of law enforcement and military units. Although he never revealed his name, he was called Sama on the radio. Sama assured Mariam that Karen was alive safe and in good spirits. He claimed that Karen was cooperative and easy to deal with, and he admired her relaxed attitude, which was one of the reasons he wanted to release her. However, he made it clear that it wasn't entirely up to him, and for a price of $2,000, he could ensure that the right people would agree to let her go. Miriam didn't trust Sama, especially since they had already paid a ransom to the cartel, who had refused to release Karen. Now, Sama was asking for more money, claiming he could help while denying that he was in charge. Despite her doubts, Miriam desperately wanted to believe that Karen was alive. Eventually, she paid Sama, only for him to disappear after taking the money. The whole ordeal felt like a nightmare for the family. Days passed, hope dwindled, and Miriam fell into depression, consumed by worry for her child. She hadn't spoken to Karen since the incident, and feared the worst. While she received calls about Karen, none were from Sama. Most were new attempts to extort money from her. She ignored most of them knowing that San Fernando was filled with opportunistic criminals who saw kidnapping as a lucrative business. However, she did pay a third ransom to one particularly convincing fraudster. In the heart of Mexico's drug war, families had become all too familiar with death, accepting its presence as a cruel reality. But when a loved one vanished without a trace, it was a torment beyond compare. The absence denied them the closure of death, leaving them to suffer the relentless agony of not knowing their child's fate. This unbearable weight ignited Miriam's thirst for retribution, driving her to take extraordinary measures that not everyone could fathom. It revealed the depths a mother would plumb for her child. Miriam seized control, casting aside the fear of her demise, and ultimately met her fate in pursuit of justice. After enduring months of agonizing anticipation for her daughter's return, Marion finally realized that Karen would never come back, at least not in the way she had fervently hoped. Karen was gone, taken from her by death. Yet, Marion's voice had no trace of self-pity, no tears streaming down her face. Instead, an unwavering determination took hold of her as she vowed to track down those accountable for her daughter's fate and make them pay for their heinous actions. On that fateful day, she left her home and reached out to Lieutenant Alex, a Marine whose contact information she had received from a stranger on a bus. Together, they delved into an investigation that led them to uncover the involvement of the Zeta cartel in her daughter's abduction. With the Marines by her side, Marion embarked on a daring raid of an old municipal landfill called the Basurero, where the Zetas were rumored to operate. Amidst the chaos, they rescued several kidnapping victims but none of them was Karen. As she moved through the dilapidated structures, she was confronted with the grim evidence of the cartel's brutality, bloodstained floors, instruments of torture, and a haunting yellow rope dangling from a tree. Fueled by an unwavering resolve, Marion pledged to bring the Zeta cartel to justice, even if it meant standing alone against their formidable power. Miriam knew from the start that the government wouldn't put much effort into finding her daughter's kidnappers. However, Having an open case would help pressure suspects and witnesses to come forward. And that's what she needed right now, witnesses. Since the Marines raid, there was only one person she knew of. Carlos, a family friend who had been at Miriam's house to fix Karen's car the night she was taken and was also kidnapped himself. By some stroke of luck, Carlos was still alive, but he refused to talk to Miriam over the phone. The little Sama shared was through Facebook messages in short, sporadic bursts. He was traumatized and scared, claiming he had seen nothing as he was blindfolded during the ordeal and only overheard conversations and names. It took weeks for Miriam to break down his resistance and finally get the name of the person Carlos said was most involved in the kidnapping, Sama. The friend was able to confirm Sama's involvement in Karen's kidnapping. Miriam had always suspected Sama's involvement in her daughter's kidnapping, despite his convincing offer to help find Karen. Miriam was sure she could recognize Sama, but the one thing she needed, and had no idea how to find, was his real identity. 
For the case to move forward, for the police to even issue a warrant, they needed Sama's name. She eventually stumbled upon a photograph on Facebook of a man resembling Sama standing beside a woman wearing an ice cream shop uniform. Further investigation revealed that the lady worked in a shop in Ciudad Victoria. Miriam had been on the hunt for weeks, staking out the ice cream store like a cat waiting for a mouse. Finally, she spotted the woman who seemed to be Sama's partner and disguised herself as a health ministry worker, knocking on neighbors' doors to gather information under the guise of a local survey. Her goal wasn't revenge, not yet. She sought answers and hoped to bring justice by relaying any information to the authorities. With evidence from her investigation and a family friend as a witness, she had enough for the police to arrest Sama under reasonable suspicion. But he had vanished without a trace when they searched for him. Months passed with no sign of Sama until a break in the case emerged. Luis Hector, now a store owner in the capital, had photos of Sama on his phone that were given to him by his mother. With a population of fewer than 350,000 people in Ciudad Victoria, where Sama was last seen, Miriam suspected that they might cross paths. Just when all hope seemed lost, a new lead emerged. On September 15, 2014, eight months after Karen's abduction and a month after losing track of Sama, Luis, who had relocated to Ciudad for safety from the cartel, spotted Sama while closing his store. Sama was subsequently arrested and interrogated, revealing the names of other gang members involved in Karen's abduction. One of them was Zapata Gonzalez, an 18-year-old boy. Miriam was surprised by his age when he was initially taken into custody. Zapata Gonzalez was the one who disclosed her daughter's location, confirming Karen's death, which was Miriam's greatest fear. Although she suspected it, there was still a glimmer of hope that Karen was alive. Learning the truth directly from one of the Zetas involved was devastating, making the pain almost tangible. Losing a child means losing a part of oneself, the part that provides structure, purpose, and love without reservation. Now, knowing what had happened to Karen after nearly a year of desperate searching was, in some ways, more comforting than distressing. This was the cruelty of a disappearance, but it also fueled Miriam's determination to find those responsible for Karen's death, bring them to justice, and hold them accountable. This determination led Miriam to an abandoned ranch riddled with bullet holes, where she made the pivotal discovery of her daughter's scarf. This revelation prompted a comprehensive excavation of the area, resulting in the discovery of multiple bodies. Only after Miriam demanded a second investigation was Karen's femur uncovered, a sight that undoubtedly caused her immense pain. Motivated by these events, Miriam established a support group for parents, and worked tirelessly to bring the Zetas to justice. Together with her group, they achieved what many police departments couldn't, despite facing retaliation from numerous cartels. Her bold public crusade posed a threat not only to a handful of kidnappers, but also to the established order in San Fernando. Her friends often questioned if she was pushing the boundaries too far. They cautioned her that it was only a matter of time before the cartels would come after her. I don't care if they take my life, Mrs. Rodriguez once confided to Miss Saldivar Villavicencio. I died the day they took my daughter. I want to put an end to this. I'm going after the people who harmed my daughter. Around March 2017, nearly 20 prisoners escaped from the prison in Ciudad Victoria. It is worth noting that Mrs. Rodriguez's tireless efforts had resulted in the incarceration of her daughter's killers. Concerned, she sought protection from the government. The police claimed they were conducting regular patrols near her home and workplace, but this would not prevent what was about to unfold. In April, just before her tragic death, Mrs. Rodriguez fractured her foot while chasing one of the final individuals on her list. When the police finally apprehended the suspect outside the home, Mrs. Rodriguez stumbled as she rushed towards them, breaking her footbone. Her family says she was still wearing her cast and using crutches on Mother's Day. At 10.21 p.m., she went home, once again, residing with her husband in the small orange house where Karen had once lived. Mrs. Rodriguez's husband had changed after Karen's disappearance. Once vibrant, he now rarely ventures outside. He gradually faded, both physically and spiritually, to the point where his children struggled to recognize him. For Mrs. Rodriguez, pursuing justice was a means of escaping the pain, but it came at a cost. Miriam parked her car on the street and painstakingly made her way out of the vehicle, moving slowly due to her injury. A group of escaped prisoners in a white Nissan truck quietly approached her. As detailed in the police report, they fired 12 bullets at her, resulting in her tragic death. This event highlighted the widespread impunity in Mexico, prompting the government to take action. They managed to apprehend two of the perpetrators and engaged in a fatal confrontation with a third. The individuals who orchestrated the attack, fearing her activism more than the consequences of their actions, remain shrouded in mystery. Luis, her son, 
became fixated on uncovering their identities. However, he also learned a harsh lesson from his mother's death, the limits of pursuing justice. Assuming leadership of his mother's collective, Luis witnessed the movement wane in her absence. Some members departed to form their groups, while others fell into silence, muted by her assassination. San Fernando, scarred by a decade of violence and a brutal war between cartel factions, fell into a period of quiet reflection. For many in San Fernando, her story epitomizes the issues plaguing Mexico and the resilience of its people in the face of government indifference. Her remarkable campaign, chronicled in case files, witness accounts, criminal confessions, and numerous interviews, briefly transformed San Fernando. Her fight inspired the community, and her death sparked outrage. The city honored her with a bronze plaque in the central plaza. Her story proves that fear is just a word, but the question is, did she go too far in her quest for revenge? Would it have been better to forget the past and stay with her family instead? Feel free to let us know in the comment section below.